okay, here I am. Live. I think. This is, um, it's kind of like praying. God, are you there? <laughs> yeah, he's there. He's there. He's here. You're probably there later, if not live. Whatever. But uh, love is the great gathering. Heaven and earth. Timeless. Timeless. Heavenly Father, help us to see. You are the great gatherer. And we're all headed home. In my thoughts, I can dream the days when we'll embrace each other. In sweet laughter we will live Without pain, without sin Without fear of time will come again For grieving That our time has passed away It shall be 
to me. If you're weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Learn of me, I am meek and lowly of heart. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy, my load is light. Lord Jesus, may we receive your words here again today. You've come to help us again and again, Lord. You know how we need help. As I sing here, seemingly alone, not alone, what a crowd surrounds. Lord, we're headed home. In the meantime, in these mean times, Lord, help us to think of that which is good and honorable and true and lovely. And Lord, may we bear that fruit of righteousness. Not the self-righteousness that leads to all of the wrangling and tussling and turmoil, but Lord, the righteousness that brings a perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray that you be for all my friends and family who are still here on this earth and who are still struggling, therefore. Lord, help them with their struggles. May something be said today that would help each of us as we look at you, Jesus, as we find our strength from you, together now. It's in your name that we hope. Amen. My guitar is going into therapy there for a little bit. Have you been having any trouble lately? No trouble at all. I just... Well, I'm not going to sit down anyway. But if you want to open your Bible along with me, we're in John chapter 7. And what we've seen here in this chapter so far, journeying through the Gospel of John, we've seen that we're all on a journey. We've seen that, um, like the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, uh, we're all living in tents, these frail human frames that we occupy right now. Like tents, like tabernacles, booths. We, we travel through a wilderness, but we're headed home. And, and we have the Lord always at the center of the camp, the one to, to hope in. And so here in John chapter 7, John alone gives us some insight into how Jesus celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. It says there in verse 2, Now the Feast of the Jews, the Feast of Booths, was at hand. And his brothers therefore said to Jesus, Depart from here and go into Judea, so your disciples also may behold your works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. So as we've seen, it's, it's, uh, it's his methods that they weren't believing in. It, 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 everything was so secretive, so subtle, uh, so slow. Come on, you know, show yourself to the world. You've got something the world needs. And, and clearly he does, but, but his method is always the best one. And he stays the course because, whew, love stays the course. Thank God for that. I think of all the bad advice I've given him over the course of time. Earnestly praying for something, and I was wrong. So, love stays the course. And it says down there in verse 10, that when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, and not publicly. He went, as it were, in secret. And the Jews, therefore, were seeking him at the feast. They were saying, where is he? And there was a lot of grumbling among the multitudes concerning him. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others, no. On the contrary, he leads the people astray. He lets them wander. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. But when it was now the midst of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus went up into the temple and he began to teach. The Jews, therefore, were marveling, saying, how can this man be learned, having never been educated in our system? Jesus therefore answered them, saying, My teaching is not mine, but it belongs to him who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, then he'll know of the teaching, whether it really is from God or whether I'm just speaking for myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there's no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law? And yet... None of you carries out the law completely. Why do you seek to kill me? The multitude answered, saying, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? But Jesus answered and said, 
I did one deed and you all marvel. On this account, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it came from Moses, it came from the patriarchs. For on the Sabbath you'll circumcise a man, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And that's where we left off last week. Jesus said we need to make judgments, to make choices, to make decisions. We shouldn't be afraid to make choices, to make decisions, even if they don't seem to go along with what the, the crowd might say we should do, or, or even our brethren, like the brethren of Jesus. You ought to do this. Well, no, it's really not the, it's not for me. It's fine for you, it's not, it's not for me. Don't be afraid to, to make choices, to make decisions. But when you make your decisions, Jesus said, don't decide with your eyes. Yet you have to see things on a deeper level. You have to get down to the core, to the heart. You have to look at things in a deeper way. There's a truer compass than just what seems to be or what we see. And it's the compass of, of our own heart that thirsts for love. A heart that longs for love. A heart that longs for unconditional, eternal, everlasting, overflowing love. It, it's, it's a longing for God. And that heart longing for God is the truest compass for the guidance of our life and the making of our decisions. Let love decide. Now in verse 25, it says, Therefore, some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, Is this not the man whom they're seeking to kill? And look, he's speaking openly. He's speaking publicly. And they're saying nothing to him. The rulers don't really know that this is the Messiah, do they? So here we have, well, you'll see it all through the chapter. It, sometimes when um, you get online, I get online, I, I read the news, I, I look around at the world, and, and I think, man, this is crazier than it's ever been. It just seems like it gets crazier and crazier and crazier. Maybe in your family, maybe among... The, the circle of your friends, the circle has been split, the chain has been broken, people unfriending you, and all of this, like, this is crazy, this is crazy, the world's gone crazy, but if you stop reading all of that for a minute and just read this chapter, you'll find out that it's always been crazy. <laughs> it's nothing new, it's humanity. And Jesus isn't ashamed to be our brother, he's not ashamed to call, us, call himself one of us, so, uh, you know, it, it is what it is, it's what we've got to work with. But here's Jesus in the temple when the crowds would come because it's one of the three big feasts of the year where everyone's got to come whether they want to or not. It's part of the law. So you got the big crowds. And when Jesus starts to teach there in, in the temple, uh, he draws a crowd. Not just because of his wonderful teaching style, but, but because he's a controversial figure. And, and the crowds gather all around him. And like we read, they, they marvel. How in the world can he be so eloquent when he's never been trained in, in all of the things that, that our leaders have been trained to do. Where, where does he get this wisdom? Where does he get this knowledge? And then there, there in verse 19, Jesus says, didn't Moses give you the law and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? So a crowd gathers, he says, you're not following the law. Why, why would you seek to kill me? And the multitude, verse 20 says, the multitude answered, you have a demon. You're crazy. You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? That's the crowd saying that. That's not the religious leaders. They, they probably would say other things like that. But it's the multitude who's saying to Jesus, you got a demon. You're, you're crazy. No one, no one is trying to kill you. And yet here as we move into this section, we see individuals giving their opinion. That was the multitude who said, you're crazy, no one's wanting to kill you. Now you start to hear something from the individual. It says, some of the people in Jerusalem, there in verse 25, some of the people were, were saying. And some of those people were saying, isn't this the man whom they're seeking to kill? So, so the crowd says, you're crazy, no one wants to kill you. But individuals, now, now you talk to the man on the street, you go with your microphone to, to people in the crowd, and, and some of them are saying, isn't this the guy that they're seeking to kill? And, and as you do these men on the street or people in the temple 
interviews, you, you, you find out that it's not the crowd kind of crazy anymore. Now it's more like the seeds of, of insanity. It's the individual craziness. Here with these popular, or not so much popular, personal opinions, here you, you get assumptions, you get speculations, you get the seeds of, of conspiracy theories. It's all through here. I just, I just told you that. <laughs> it says it right here. They're, they're saying, verse 25, isn't this the man whom they're seeking to kill? And look, he's speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. You know, the famous they. There he is, speaking publicly, and they're not saying anything. The rulers don't really know that this is the Messiah, do they? You know, already they're thinking, maybe because he's publicly speaking, and no one's trying to arrest him, and no one's trying to kill him, and we happen to know that they want to, even though the crowd thinks that's crazy. I, as an individual, think that's the case, but why are they letting him speak? Why aren't they doing something? Do they think that maybe he is the Messiah and this is uh, fake news or some sort of, of uh, double trick going on? Anyway, that's the kind of stuff they seem to be thinking. They, why, why is this being allowed? And then they say, verse 27, you know, that however we know, you know, they don't know, but we know, we know where this man is from. And if you know and I know, they don't know, but they think they know. We know where this man is from. But whenever the Messiah may come, no one knows where he's from. You know, that was, that was kind of a myth that when, like, you'll never know where the Messiah came from. When he, when he comes, it's going to be, ooh, you know, kind of like all the Antichrist speculations. They, they were saying kind of things about the Christ. He's the mystery man. He, even though there's lots of verses, you know the verses in the Old Testament that talk about his, his physical lineage and place of birth and all of that. But, uh, oh, there's a... There's a a myth out there that whenever the Messiah comes, uh, no one will know. So uh, I just point out that people have always been crazy. As a crowd, as individuals, you got this mix of facts. Some of them are true. They're in, in pseudo facts and then folk tales and all of it mingled together. And, and whew, none, none, of, none of that's new. The, the, the crowds are crazy in mass and they come up with a, a mass declaration. The multitude says, Jesus is crazy, and uh, no one wants to kill him. But the individuals, they're, they're, they're lost in their own minds, in, in their own little mental maze. They've got their own confusion. We all do. <laughs> we all do. It changes when we come into a crowd, but we've all got these little places where we're lost. Maybe not lost in the same little backwoods and eddies and corners, but we're lost. <laughs> Each of us, like sheep, we've gone astray. Again, that's, that's human nature. Good shepherd loves us. He's come to help us. So here's the situation. And it says in, in response, verse 28, Jesus therefore cried out in the temple. And he was teaching them as he cried out. And he was saying, you both know me and know where I am from. And I have not come of myself. But he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him. And he's the one who sent me. So it says Jesus cried out as he taught. I, I don't think that's typical. From what I can tell, I mean, yes, he had to speak loud enough that a multitude might hear him, but typically he was teaching just a few people at a time. And typically Jesus wasn't your classic preacher of high volume, you know, like if you don't have a whole lot to say, just say it louder. Jesus didn't typically turn up the volume, but... But he does hear it. says it twice in the temple in this chapter. He turns up the volume. He, he cries out. They, they may not hear. Typically he would say, let him who has ears to hear, let them hear. This time he, he cries out. But when he does, he, he doesn't address their, their false assumptions. You know, like we've seen and, and we'll see all through this chapter, no matter where you turn and whose opinion you, you take, there, there's false assumptions, there's false accusations, uh, there's people accusing one another, there's all this sort of stuff going on. But the interesting thing, the, the teaching thing for me, is that Jesus doesn't address their false accusations or false assumptions. He doesn't, he doesn't get down there and, and wrestle in the weeds with them, so to speak, like, like I tend to do. He doesn't fumble around in, in their fog and and try to fix everything. He, he, does, he does two things. He first of all affirms what he can affirm. If, if they said something true, even if it's only partially true, 
he, he agrees, yeah. And then having done so, he, he centers on the core. He says, but, but here's the issue. And like I said, oh, Jesus, help me. I need to learn that. I think I'm learning, but man, that's one of the places where I've made a lot of mistakes in my lifetime, where I think I'm fighting the good fight, but you know what? I'm not fighting in a good way, and it's really not even good. It's not good for the listener. It's not good for me. Uh, when, when something comes to me, and it's about me, and I happen to know it's just not true, false assumptions, false accusations, it might be sent, something sent personally to me based on half the facts, and, and uh, I see where it's going, and I feel offended, I feel maybe a little bit attacked, or, or something I overhear. It's, at any rate, it happens to all of us. Maybe a little bit more to someone like me who's a bit of a public figure to some extent, at least I was for a lot of years. At any rate, my tendency is, is to want to wanna address that. I mean like a lawyer. I want to point by point write something that refutes, that refutes all of those false assumptions, all those false accusations. You say this, no. You said that, no. I, I want to go down the whole, I mean, and you can certainly easily do that with this. All these people are partially right in, in some ways, but that's my, that's my tendency. And if I've ever done that to you at some point, I mean, if you're one of these people who maybe I haven't seen you in a long time, and maybe the last thing you remember of me is, uh, is winning an argument in my mind and then losing relationships because, well, I was right. And I showed you, you didn't see it, but I showed you point by point by point by point by point, point you know, blah, 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 blah. you know, that's a, that's a, I, my, my dear Brian has pointed out to me, tried to point it out for a long time, that's, that's a form of bullying. Me, Bruce, bully, I'm gentle, I'm tender, I'm a nice guy. I cry at the drop of a hat. I'm a softie, eh? You know, when you, when you think you're right about something, and I tend to think I'm right about a lot of things. I'm not growing that. <laughs> but, but um, yeah. And so you, you may, in your mind, win the argument. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And maybe, maybe, I was right about something. But, you know, what's not right is to, is to think you got to just get down there and argue every point to where, you know, people may say, okay, he's right. Or he thinks he's right. But you know what? I... I don't feel like he cares for me. I don't think he feel. I don't feel like he wants to listen. I don't think he wants to hear anything I say right, and then affirm that I said something right. He just wants to show me how what I said wasn't completely right. Okay, enough about me. I know it's hard. Enough about me. Jesus just isn't that way, and that's God help me. That's what I need to learn. First of all, Jesus concedes something. They said, they, we, we know where he's from. And they meant, well, they, they could have meant a couple of things, but most likely they meant he's from Nazareth, and he came from Galilee, and, and of course the baggage that comes with that. Any good thing come out of Nazareth. Uh, Joseph and Mary and his brothers, we know them, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Jesus concedes that. He, he says here, you both know me, and you know where I am from. He says, that's true. At least as far as they see. He doesn't say, oh, but you don't really know. It, I, I was born in Bethlehem, and haven't you read Matthew chapter 1, and don't you know the Christmas story? And besides, Joseph is not really my natural father, and yada, yada, yada. He doesn't do that. He, he concedes what they see as being true, and he says, you, you do. You both know me, and you know where I'm from. And, that, and that's the way I take that today as Jesus conceding something and saying, you know, you're right. And he doesn't even say, and you're only partially right. He simply says, you're right about that. And, you know, I used to think that Jesus was being sarcastic there. Oh, yeah, you know me and you get there. I, I think I saw Jesus the way, well, I think we all tend to do that. I saw Jesus as a little bit too much like myself. <laughs> and I tend to be sarcastic. I can be, it's, it's part of my arsenal. You know, to, to say something I don't really mean, but uh, there. Doesn't that, doesn't that make you feel stupid? Huh. I thought, enough about me. Didn't I say that? Anyway, 
Jesus doesn't, I don't think he's being sarcastic. I think his point is that is all this stuff about my human origin, however much you may or may not know about it, my human origin, my birthplace, my birth certificate, my pedigree, my family tree, my, my education, my credentials, all this stuff you're curious about, none of that is the core, none of that really is the issue. None of that really, my human origin isn't what matters. What matters is the heart, the core of who I am. And he says, you both know me and you know where I'm from, but I haven't come of myself. He who sent me is true, whom you do not know. And you know, that's the core. You don't know God. And oh boy, that's a talk about fighting words. We can throw that around in different religious people. You don't know God? Well, you don't know God either. And you know, the way people fight over stuff like that, it convinces me maybe we, maybe a lot of us don't know God all that much. But if you know that God is love, God is spirit, God is love, love is patient, love is kind, it's not boastful, rude, arrogant, selfish, you can, you can go down on this. But if you know that God is love, then you know a lot. You, you can't know it all because that love, height, let, Length, depth, breadth is beyond knowledge. But if you know that God is love, that's the core. And Jesus said, that's the core problem. You, you don't know that God is love. And love is not what you're seeking. Love is not what you're... All this stuff of human origin stuff. Stuff you fight over, but does it really matter? He, he said, remember back there in verse 16, he answered them saying, my teaching is not my own, but him who sent me. And if any man is willing to do his will, then he'll know of the teaching, whether it's of God or whether I speak from myself. Jesus said there that, that look, if you're wondering about whether it's true, it's not check my credentials and go back and fact check me. It's, it's what do you really want anyway? And if you want God, who is love, if, if you want love, unconditional love, everlasting love, overflowing love, personal love, filial love, Father's love, family love. If that's what you're looking for, then you'll know my teaching is aligned with that. And all of that. And if that's what you want, that's all you want, then you're free. Because perfect love casts out all fear. If all you want is to interact with that love, to receive it and to share that, then, hey, you'll know the teaching. And, and uh, you, you won't be worried about all these little ancillary things that you keep getting stuck on. It says there in verse 30, they were seeking therefore to seize him, <laughs> to arrest him. But, but no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. But many of the multitude, they believed in him. They were saying, when the Messiah shall come, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? And, and you know, even in there, that, that belief was about the number of signs. It wasn't the number. It was, it was always about the character, the fruit, the kindness. It was, it was the type of signs that he did, not the number of signs, not a, something written across the sky. It was his caring ways, all the things we see here in the Gospel of John. But anyway. It says, verse 32, that the Pharisees heard the multitude muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and the Pharisees then sent officers to seize him. So the, the crowds are, are, are crazy. The individuals are confused. The, the Pharisees and religious leaders are frightened. You know, rather than just say, oh, the people are muttering, they're it's like, no, this, this muttering matters. What's this going to lead to? And ultimately, this, it may lead to us not being the leaders anymore. And we don't want that. And so they're, they're, they're frightened. They want to have him stopped, have him arrested. It says in verse 33, Jesus therefore said, For a little while longer I am with you, and then I go to him who sent me. You shall seek me, and you shall not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews therefore said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we shall not find him? He's not intending to go out to the dispersion among the Greeks, you know, out in the Mediterranean world where 
where the Jews have been scattered all over places where like Paul would go later. He's not intending to go there and to teach the Greeks, the Gentiles, is he? What is the statement that he just said, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? What does that mean? I'll tell you this, it's, it's not a, a time limit for altar calls. It's not saying, oh, you know, if you don't deceive me now, one day later you'll be calling out for mercy and saying, God, forgive me, and oh, I was so wrong, and, and won't you... Won't you forgive me? Won't you receive me? And God says, oh, no, 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 no. Time's up. It's too late. That picture is in a lot of places, but it's not in the Bible. I mean, there, there are some stories, and I don't want to get distracting or distracted right now, but mercy hasn't a time limit. It's not like, oh, if you are looking for grace and mercy and forgiveness, you'll find it. If you're looking for something else, you may be very, very frustrated. These folks were wanting to arrest him. They were trying to stop him. They were trying to silence him. That's who he's talking to. That's, that's who he speaks these words to. He's, he's speaking to those who, try to, who would like to silence him. They, they would, they're afraid of his influence. They would like to end his influence over their constituency, over the, the people that they have in their following. He might follow. They might follow him. They, they want to stop that. And Jesus simply and clearly says here, to my comfort, he says, you can't. You can't do that. The, the window in which you can lay hands of me and your hatred and your desire to arrest me, that window is going to be very small, and it's not now, because uh, not this feast, not this year, later, Passover, I'll allow that. But not now. Love stays his course. Love, love makes it clear. Love is in control. And he makes it clear, look, I'm going to leave. No one takes my life. I'm going to lay my life down. And I'm going to leave in my own good time. And I'm going to leave in my own good way. Which is the Calvary way. Which is a way that seems like hatred designed it, but, but God in love overrode it. And, and he made something wonderful out of something terrible. And he says, you, you will seek me You'll seek to seize me now, but you can't. Later, you will. But, but he says a time will come when you'll want to seize me, you'll want to lay your hands on me, and you won't be able to. And again, it's to those who would do so in, in hatred, in a desire to, to silence him. You know, after Jesus died, it's, it's one of the many fascinating things to me, that, that after he said it's finished, only loving hands laid hold of him. It was loving hands that took him from the cross. It was loving hands that brought him to the tomb. It was loving hands that, uh, that put the pounds of ointment upon him. It was loving hands that touched the crucified Christ after he died, after it was finished. And certainly once he was risen, it was only loving hearts. And in some cases, even loving hands that if they wanted, they could embrace, they could... They could interact with the risen Christ, but only in love. That's the way it works. Those who want to stop him, those who want to silence him, those who want to apprehend him, they couldn't do it then, and they certainly couldn't do it later. They would do it for a little while when he allowed it. But don't you think, talk about laying hold of the body of Jesus, don't you think that those who wanted to silence Christianity would have loved to have laid hold of his body? Bring out the body of evidence. Bring out the corpse. Bring out the dead Jesus. That's the end of Christianity. They, they couldn't do it. They can't do it. They couldn't produce the body. They, they can't arrest the love. The darkness cannot overwhelm the light. That, that is good, good news. Now, it says, verse 37, on the last day, that is the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out again. And he said, If anyone is thirsty, let that person come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For that Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Not yet glorified. 
cool. Even though there are many hints, more than hints, in the Old Testament. But in spite of that, who, who could have guessed that glorification began with crucifixion? Who could have guessed that, that, that that's where it started? That's where he began to reign as a king, granting forgiveness and, and putting families together, even there on the cross. That's all part of the glorification process for him, for us, for humanity. You know, his, his brothers counseled him. Put, if you want to do something fast, put on a public show. And, and of course, really the only public show that he would give, he would allow, would be that public shame. Because that was the beginning of the proof. The, the, the proof of his personal love. God's personal love. God so loved the world, he gave his son. Jesus laid down his life. Personal love for people who have fallen, who have failed, who have crucified him. Personal love for people who've done all kinds of foolish things. People like me. People like you, whoever you are. Personal love. Proven. Proven. No one can take that away. No one should take it away from you. Don't, don't let go of that. And the spirit that he gave, the spirit that he would give, that spirit is his spirit. The, the spirit is himself. It's his life. It's his love. It's his spirit. And obviously he couldn't give his life until he gave his life. He couldn't give that spirit until he gave his spirit. And from the cross he, he, he said it's finished and he said to the Father, receive my spirit. When the Holy Spirit came forth, I, I, this is not a trinity issue. I, I don't understand it. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But as much as I believe something like that, triune love that I can understand, I also understand that, that they are one. That the, the spirit he would give was himself, his life, his love, personal love. And once he had given it on the cross, he can give it forevermore. It flows. The rock of ages was cleft. The rock in the wilderness, like Moses, hit the rock. The waters come out. And it flows. And it flows, and it flows, and it flows, and it flows. And it gets wider, and it gets deeper the further it goes. That's the picture. <laughs> That's the promise. It's true for you. Wherever you are, whatever, whatever you've done, if you're thirsty, come to him. Come to him. Now, in this whole section, that's, that's as far as reading verses goes, that's as far as I'm going to go, but there are so many things to see. And I encourage you, read ahead, look, see what you can see. Uh, but for my time here today with, with you, uh, let me just leave you with a couple of things that I see. A couple of, of observations that um, think on it. And if it's true and good, then act on it. But the, but the first thing I would um, point out, we've talked about it all, of course, but, but the first thing is, is how long we can be. In fact, you know, I, I don't think we can get very far until we, we start with that. How, how long we can be. Even in a crowd, how, how long the whole crowd can be. In fact, maybe more likely in a crowd. How individually, how lost we can be. And, and in fact, I think that if you read through to the end of this chapter, there's quite a few more verses, and you analyze every single observation, whether it be from the leaders or the common folk in there in the temple, whoever it would be, I think if you analyze every single observation, you would find out that None. None but Jesus. Nobody truly sees. Nobody fully sees. And that's why, as Jesus said, we, we can't make our judgments by what we see. We, we have to go to something deeper. To judge justly. We've got to go to the core. We've got to go to the heart. My heart has plenty of problems, but I know who my great physician is. And, and, it's, and it's not the... the sicknesses of the heart. It's, it's the seeing of the heart. It's the longing of the heart. It's that heart desire to, to be loved and to love and to see with those eyes and to judge 
with that judgment, to let love guide you, to let love lead you. That's, that's observation number one. Not, number two, nothing new, but crowds are crazy. It just, I see it again here, especially in this whole thing about the, the multitude saying, who seeks to kill you? You've got a demon, you're crazy. The multitude said that. Crowds, crowds are crazy, you know. The mob mentality. The way we all get worked up when we get into a group. You know, in, in this country, thank God. I do thank God. We've got a wonderful thing in our Constitution about having the freedom to assemble, the freedom to gather, the freedom to get together. But once we've exercised the freedom to assemble, I think we often surrender the freedom to think freely. We get into the group when we stop thinking. And, and, and some things are said and done that, that fly in the face of love. But oh man, we got worked up in the gang. We got worked up in the group. And, and that whole group think, that whole mob mentality. Free to assemble, but don't surrender your freedom to think for yourself. And thinking for yourself, not like, oh no, I'm a sinner. I can't think for myself. God is good. And he can lead your heart. Let your heart hold his hand. And then, yes, do. Think. Think. And even if your brothers say, you ought to do this or you ought to do that, do, do what he says. It's, it's the same crowd there that says, Jesus is crazy. No one wants to kill him. It, it's the same crowd that later on says, Hosanna to the son of David. Now, when I say the same crowd, I'm not talking about the same individuals. In fact, probably not the same individuals. Once we get into a group, once we get into a crowd, we stop being individuals. Maybe a whole different group of individuals, but the same crowd that says Jesus is crazy, no one's seeking to kill him, that's the crowd that when Jesus came in on a donkey, Hosanna, wave the palm branches, make Israel greater. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Hosanna, son of David. The same crowd who later that same week said, give us Barabbas. <laughs> give us a, a real revolutionary. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. Same crowd. Again, many different individuals, but same crowd. Same crowd who last chapter, chapter 6, said, we want a king. Him. We want to make him the king. He, look at the bread. Look what he can do. Let's make him king. Let's make him king and if we king him, then he, wow, he, then he can move forward and backward and we can jump one of our enemies because we got a king. Let's king him. The same crowd that says in chapter 6, king him. They now say, kill him. Oh, the crowd doesn't say that. No, the crowd says nobody wants to kill him. But, you see, it's this desire. Whether you want to king him or kill him, it's this desire to have him mine in my own selfish sense. He's my Jesus. Not yours. God bless me and mine. Not you and yours. What's the difference? To kill him, to kill him? It's all about, I want to control him. Control him to have him just go away because he's messing with my gig. Or control him in a way where we can harness his power, his ability to do things on the man. Either way, it's not him you want. You can say his name all you want, but he's not a magic genie, rub the lamp, say the word. No. But do you want to do his will? Do you want to do the Father's will? That's the, that's the safety zone. So crowds, crowds can get crazy. Okay? Obviously, we're not in a crowd right now. But, but we will be again. And the answer to that, if you agree with me, the answer to that is not finding a smaller crowd, finding a smaller assembly, finding a smaller group that agrees with us. Everyone else is crazy out there. We're the one little tight-knit group that's not crazy. <laughs> You're not. I love it. Those are the craziest websites of all. Those are the craziest cults, the ones that, that like, everyone else is nuts. They're all mainstream, and we're the, we're the right ones on the fringe. The left ones on the French. <laughs> All of those kinds of groupings, they hijack the heart. The heart that longs for love, the heart that longs for, for value and importance and meaning, 
these groups grab hold of that and, and now, oh, I have meaning because I'm part of this group. I have importance because I'm part of this group. We're the ones who've got it right. I'm loved because I'm in this gang. Everyone in the gang loves me. Yeah. But think for yourself for a moment and see, see how it works. So, so the answer, okay, we, we can go really long. That's point one. Point two is the, the crowds are crazy. <laughs> okay. doesn't help us to get together. Even if we all get together and agree that we're right, it doesn't make us right. It's just a group of people. Maybe a group of scary people. But at any rate, the, the answer, of course, is right here. The answer is Jesus. The answer is take that longing, take that car, core, take that love, and then personally, individually, just you, and if no one but you, personally, individually, take that looking for love and look to him and know that you're loved. Know that you're important. Know that you're valued. Know that your life matters, that it has meaning individually as we do that. We learn that we're loved. We learn to love. Then we can get back together and do something good for one another. But here it says, Jesus stood up and he cried out. There in the temple on the great day of the feast, he stood up and he cried out. And you know what? He never stopped. He's never stopped standing and he's never stopped crying out. Every attempt to silence him only made it worse for his enemies. And, and better for his friends. Better for you and I. Every time people tried to, to, to put him to death, it only proved how much his love overwhelms death. They're so afraid here. Oh, he's not going to run away and go out to the Greeks and spread this scary false doctrine out there, is he? <laughs> we'll, we'll put him to death. But you know what? You can't. And love wins. And you know what? In the spirit, of course he went out there and taught the Greeks and taught everyone. God loves you. God cares for you. you. You matter. And you know what? Even these people who were trying to stop him, Jesus loved them. Jesus loved those leaders. Jesus wanted them to hear. It was to them. If anyone, if anyone is thirsting for love, thirsting for life, for what matters most, if that's what you're wanting, come to me. But you see, the, people, the, the, the leaders, at least at this point, they didn't want to. Because why? Heck, if everyone follows Jesus, I'm not a leader anymore. You know, they, they, they love their jobs more than their lives. There's lots of crazy things like that we can do, but Jesus is Jesus. He, he cares for each of us. And in that cry, as he stood up and he cried out, there, there isn't any room for a crowd. The, the, the thing he said, if, if any individual... Not a crowd. If any individual is thirsty, let that individual come to me and drink. There's no, there's no room for a crowd. It's just one person at a time. And it could be all of humanity, but it's only going to be one person, one thirsty person at a time. So, if ever in life, this week or next, would, would, if ever you feel like, man, I could really use a drink, you could. And Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. Crowds, crowds can get crazy drunk. Different drugs, different kinds of Kool-Aid. They all do their thing, but, but Jesus is the one. When we come to him individually, the more we drink, the more sober we get. Not sober like in a puritanical sense. In a joyful, in a wonderful way. It's a wonderful world. It's a, it's a wonderful life. All the good things, all the beautiful things, all the lovely things. The more we drink of his love, the more we love. And the more we grow. And when we drink of his spirit, we, we don't become crazy nuts like we can do with other types of drink. Not you. But when we drink of Jesus, we, we don't become robots. We become more ourselves more our own personality. More the, the person that God loves and he created us to be. So, you know, we long to get together. We will get together this, this pandemic thing. And of course this will, this will pass. There's so many good things to, to focus on. So many good things to learn th this week. 
And whenever we do get together, you know, where we are, whenever we do get together with others, especially if it's a, around something like religion or politics, which become the big, big battle zones, whenever we get together, it shouldn't be in search of love, in, in search of meaning, in search of, of a sense of importance. When we get together, it should be because we've already found love. We've already found meaning. We've already found our importance personally with Jesus in a way that no one can enter in and no one can take away. I have found it with him. I find it every time I turn my heart to him. There he is. And because I have found it with him, then I'll get together with you. And if we get together and find out we have different views and different opinions and different ways of looking at things, hey, didn't the early disciples, isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that where love comes in? Because we have to grow up. We have to learn to share the love that we gained from him. And now we learn to, to listen and love and grow in our relationship with one another. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for freedom. And forgive us, Lord, the many ways in which we've thrown that freedom away. Or maybe put others into bondage because they didn't line up with our idea of freedom. Lord, forgive us but even more, Lord, free us. May your love free us from fear. And all the things that fear can then lead us to say and to do. Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for modern technology and the fact that we can get together in ways that would have seemed like voodoo 20, 30 years ago. But we can do that. And you know, Lord, I, Technology can never outpace what, what your spirit can do. We're, we're not that far. We're never that far from those that love us and those that we love us, that love us, whatever. <laughs> we're never far. We're never far. Heaven is within, and heaven is all around, even as you are. May we walk in that spirit and, and Lord, take care of us. Help us just take our eyes off of our troubles. Thanks, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.